Open your Bibles with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. God willing, that's the last time that uh, I'll be saying that at the beginning of a sermon. We've been uh, in Timothy for a while now. My, my intention is, God willing, next week I'm going to do a topical message, and the following week, because someone respect, requested it of me, and I prayed about it, didn't see a reason not to, the following week we are going to begin this year's expository series. We're going to be studying through the book of Revelation. Can you have it? Um, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals him to us and also reveals to us the things which must shortly take place. But that's the, the week after next. If you have uh, the family or friends that are interested or have questions about the end times, whether they're saved or not, by all means bring them. And we'll be, again, God willing, this uh, week after next. But today we're looking at the close of Timothy. We're looking at the close of Paul's life. And the picture on the screen is a, a wreath, a crown of leaves, and this one is made out of gold. This particular one, I believe, is in a Vatican museum. But the, uh, the victorious athletes, like at the Olympics and the, the other uh, chariot races and similar games, the victorious military leaders... If you were a general or an admiral and had won a significant battle, as part of your victory celebration, you would be given a wreath, a crown of leaves to put around your head. We most commonly think of them as laurel leaves because that's laurel leaves because that's what um, the Romans used. But it wasn't always laurel. Other areas had distinctives. I believe it was Antioch used grape leaves in their victor's crowns as a, as a celebration because grapes was what they grew in that area. When we get to Revelation, we'll talk about an interesting uh, um, difference in words. Both kinds of crowns are in Revelation, and in Greek, they're two different words. The word used here for the crown of righteousness is stephanos. It's that wreath, that, that wreath of leaves, a ruler's crown, a king's crown, is in Greek a diadema, and we'll see that. But here we are at the end of Paul's life, his final instructions, his final words to his young disciple, and this which was almost certainly his final epistle, and it'll be interesting to see what he has to say and how it applies to us. Even though we looked through the first portion of the chapter last week, I'm going to read all of Second Timothy chapter 4. Would you read with me, please? 2 Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Verse 9, make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. 
When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father God, we thank you for this testimony, this testimony of the man that you had called out of opposition into your service. We thank you for the story of his life and for the legacy of his ministry. We thank you for this book and the other epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. Lord, thank you that in your providence, these books were saved for us to learn from. Lord, I pray that we would walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that we would walk in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, that we would be disciples committed to preaching your word and sharing your good news in the midst of a dark world where things are going from bad to worse and people have turned aside from the truth and turned to myths. Lord, we pray that we will be faithful to you as Paul was and not faithless. Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to us through your word, that as we look through this passage, as I share and highlight and illustrate these truths, that your Holy Spirit would both challenge and encourage us. Lord, as we've talked about a culture that's going from bad to worse, thank you for the instruction that we are to pray for those in authority over us. And Lord, we do so in obedience to your word. We pray for those in authority over us, from the President of the United States to the Governor of Arizona and down to our, our local officials. Lord, I pray that you would draw them into your wisdom. Lord, I pray for revival in America. And Lord, I pray that we might be able to live sensible and quiet lives without fear of oppression. Thank you for the freedom that we do enjoy, and I pray that we would make the most of it to share your word as we anticipate Jesus' return. Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we submit to you, we ask for the guidance and ministry of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The opening verse of today's passage, verse 6, highlights that Paul expected to die. His execution was soon at hand. The biblical record does not record Paul's death. The book of Acts ends with Paul on trial, and we have reason to believe that he was not executed at that time, that he got out and did more ministry, possibly made it to Spain. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, Paul here expected to die, expected to be poured out as a drink offering. The technical word for that, which nobody uses anymore, is libation. A libation, a drink offering. Um, How many of you, before you drank your wine, hopefully you didn't have wine for breakfast, uh, poured out your wine to the gods before having, having some yourself? That was very common among the pagans. 
it also was part of the Jewish ritual. If you look in Leviticus, along with the morning and evening offering of a lamb, they were to give an offering of strong drink to the God, the God, their God, the God of the Bible, a drink offering. That's the picture Paul uses here. He uses the same picture of himself in Philippians where he was considering the possibility of his death then being poured out as a drink offering. Why a drink offering? What's that focused on? He's talking about his blood being shed as Jesus' blood was shed for us. The, again, the Bible is silent about the details of Paul's death, but the early church leader and historian Eusebius records for us that the Apostle Paul was executed by beheading at the orders of the Emperor Nero about the same time that Peter was crucified at the orders of the Emperor Nero. And a very brief time period, perhaps only weeks, before Nero himself was also killed by an angry mob. It's relevant to remember that in Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul commanded his readers, commanded us, to be subject to the governing authorities. Who was the governing authority in Paul's life? Nero, who eventually executed him. Paul's public ministry, his missionary journeys and so on, almost exactly overlap with Nero's reign. When you read Paul's instructions about governments, remember that's who he's talking about. You may or may not be pleased with the direction your government is going right now, but remember, we are commanded to be in subjection to and to pray for the ruling authorities. But here Paul expects to die, and we'll come back to that later on in the passage. He is confident of his legacy. Read me again that short but profound verse, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Two metaphors, a fight. He didn't throw in the towel. A race. He didn't quit, drop out. And then the statement, I have kept the faith. Will that be your testimony on your deathbed? Will that be your legacy? As we look through the chapter and look at the people he talks about, that wasn't going to be everybody's legacy, but this was his. And as he looked back at this end of his life, did he have things to regret? Yes, he'd been a persecutor of Christians before he was saved. And yet he'd lived his life for Christ since he got saved. And he was confident in his testimony, in his legacy, in his ministry. He had kept the faith. Looking through the details there, look down at another one that will jump ahead to verse 17. We'll talk at verse 17 in a minute, but I'm picking a detail out of it. Now the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. That's another aspect, another subset of the Apostle Paul's legacy, of his testimony, of what he could look at as he looked back over his life. This is a map of the western two-thirds of the Mediterranean. And if you look at all those dots, those are cities where Paul ministered. And over here on the left, there's an arrow pointing towards Spain. We know from the book of Romans, there's two different, mis min mis two different mentions. He was planning to go to Spain as a missionary. There's pretty good evidence that he had a further missionary journey after the book of Acts, after the close of the book of Acts, maybe he made it to Spain. 
there are not real early church uh, records or traditions that he even made it to Britain. That's a little bit iffy. But very probably he made it to Spain. And Spain was the end of the world. Remember, Columbus hadn't sailed yet. Spain was as far as he could go. On the reverse side of your sermon notes is a list of some items from Paul's testimony. And it includes one of the verses that highlights he, uh, he started from Jerusalem and was going to make it to Spain. Remember Jesus' command in the Great Commission from Jerusalem even to the ends of the earth? The Apostle Paul had lived that out. I'm going to highlight another aspect of Paul's testimony that is sort of uh, uh, between the lines here in this passage. You could see it in his confidence and faith. But Paul's testimony beyond that was a testimony of knowing Jesus. He knew Jesus. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. It's back to your left just a little bit in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read beginning with verse 7. This is Paul's testimony. From Philippians chapter 3. Whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead." Paul's testimony was not just in what he had accomplished, was not just in having kept the faith and stood firm for Christ. Paul's testimony was that he knew Jesus and had a relationship with him. You and I may not be called to spread the gospel to cities all around the north and east perimeter of the Mediterranean. You and I may not be called to suffer as Paul was. The verses about his suffering from 2 Corinthians 11 on that list on the reverse side of your sermon notes. But we all have the privilege, we all have the opportunity, we all have the challenge of having this kind of relationship with Jesus, making knowing him the highest priority. Here we are at the beginning of the year. What are your priorities for the year? Is knowing Jesus your highest priority? I could pound the pulpit some more on that one, but there's a lot more in this passage, so let's move on. Paul was confident in his testimony. He was confident of his legacy. He was confident in his reward. Let me turn with me. You can turn with me back to Timothy. Read again verse 8. I will pick it up at 7 just to get the whole context. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing. The crown of righteousness, again, a victor's wreath. Crown of righteousness. In James, it talks about the crown of life. In Jesus' letter to the church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, they were undergoing persecution, including martyrdom, and he said, be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. But this is the only place where it mentions the crown of righteousness, the reward that God has for those who are righteous. It is the peak 
football season. We just finished with all the college bowl games, and now we've dived into the pros. Peak football season. When I'm at my mother-in-law's house, which I was for an extended period of time over Christmas, most of you know the story. Um, Sometimes I watch football because I don't watch TV the rest of the year, and I'd rather watch football than whatever else she has on. So I watch college bowl games. I'm not that much of a college football fan, frankly, but I watch some college bowl games. Some of the trophies they have for the bowl games are really weird. I don't know which bowl it was I was watching, but the trophy was this giant image of a pig. Is that what you play football for? Anybody know what? What's, no, I want to ask. The our trophy for fighting the good fight, running the race without quitting, our trophy for knowing Jesus is the crown of righteousness. That beats any earthly trophy you can mention. The rest of the passage is very personal. The aged apostle is talking about his aloneness. And being alone in a Roman prison was literally life-threatening. They didn't feed you. You were dependent on your friends outside bringing you food. He's alone. So he's writing to Timothy about his aloneness. And he talks about and lists in this passage a bunch of people. There's a bunch of names, and it's interesting to look at the names, and unfortunately, not all of them are mentioned positively. Paul had friends. He also had false friends. The first one mentioned in the list, picking it up at verse 9, make every effort to come to me soon, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Wow. Talk about legacy. We're reading about the Apostle Paul's legacy. This is Demas' legacy. This is what we know about Demas, written in God's word. Here we are reading it 2,000 years later. Is this what you want people to remember about you? Paul mentions Demas as as a co-worker in two other passages, including Colossians. But this is how it ends up. Demas had not only deserted Paul, but by the statement that he loved this present world, it highlights that he had deserted Christ. The promises of assurance of salvation are real and they're precious. But the New Testament is not silent about the reality that people who seem to have been saved walk away from the faith. And 1 John chapter 2 says those who leave were not really of us to begin with. Demas left. In Jesus' band of 12 followers, he had a Judas. In Paul's list of close associates and traveling companions, he had a Demas. It's not surprising, it's sad, it's tragic, it's damaging when people walk away. Remember, we talk about spiritual warfare. A reality of warfare is casualties. Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Because he loved this present world. Rather be about worldly things than godly things. By the way, that contrasts well with Timothy, whom we'll talk about in a minute. Besides Demas, he mentions a character called Alexander. In verses 14 and 15, Alexander the coppersmith opposed them. There's an Alexander that Paul had kicked out of the church that he mentions in 1 Timothy, Possibly it was the same guy. In any case, Paul had opposition. We shouldn't be surprised when we have opposition. Again, we have an enemy, the devil. Satan, his formal name means opposer. He's opposed to God. He's opposed to everything that relates to God. So these are the the, the bad guys among all these names listed here. There's another category. Look at verse 11. Fascinating little statement. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark 
and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. What do we know about Mark? When Paul first went out on his missionary journey, who was his partner and teammate? Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. In fact, it started out Barnabas and Paul, and after their first stop and their first convert, all of a sudden it's Paul and Barnabas. God's order, as it's written in Scripture, it becomes Paul and Barnabas. Along about that same time, Mark, who was with them and was Barnabas' cousin, abandoned the missionary team, took off. When Paul was ready to go on a second trip, he wanted to, uh, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with him. Paul said, I don't take losers and dropouts with me, and they had a quarrel and split up. That was not a good thing. It almost seems like Barnabas was right. That was one of the first in a sequence of unhappy events that led the Apostle Paul to Philippi, which is in Europe. None of us have European ancestry, do we? Are we glad the gospel got to Europe? But that's Mark. He dropped out. He'd failed. But apparently, he didn't stay in failure. He came back to God. He came back to ministry. And at the end of his life, Paul says, I'd love to have Mark here ministering with me. That's, in a nutshell, Mark. And there's an interesting statement on down the passage in verse 16. Verse 16, Paul writing, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against him. Again, in the overall context, he's talking about his aloneness. But here he has his first event before the Roman judiciary system in Rome, and nobody from the church at Rome showed up to stand with him, showed up to testify for him, showed up to give him a character witness, showed up to give him a drink of water after the hearing. He's not bitter about it. He says, may God not hold it against them. But he's mentioning it to highlight his aloneness, and his, his pressing Timothy to come see him. My friends, a reality of being part of any community is that sometimes you feel like you should be involved or drawn in, and you're not. That's a reality of being part of a church as well. I remember, I don't know, 13, 15 years ago, a young lady from this church that was pretty involved had backslidden, put it quite bluntly. She was out in the world doing worldly things for a while. My wife and I reached out to her, and she complained about our church. Now, frankly, our church is a pretty warm and loving church, and you care about each other, and you guys do that well. But she complained about our church. You know what her complaint was? Nobody reached out to me. Well, that wasn't true. My wife and myself had reached out to her, but that didn't count. You know why? They're expected to do it. They're paid to do it. The person I'm talking about no longer lives in this community, but she is doing well and walking with the Lord, and I got a Christmas card from her a few weeks ago. That's all good now. But when you're part of the community, sooner or later, they will feel a time like they should have reached out to you better. They should have ministered to you better. That's true of us, too. We're a fallible set of people. The preacher's not perfect. Neither are the pew sitters. When Satan tempts you to get mad at everybody in general because they weren't there for you at this particular time, be like Paul and forgive them. Forgive us. That's just a reality of being part of a community. The, the sense of loneliness is something the devil will use against us sooner or later in any case. But we looked at the enemies, really, the false friends. By the way, in that list of sufferings from uh, 2 Corinthians 11, it's on the back of your notes, one of the things he mentions danger was danger from false Christians. And then we get to the good guys, the loyal friends. Who's he writing to? He's writing to Timothy. Timothy was his young disciple. He's depending on Timothy. He's instructing Timothy how to lead the church after he's gone. He's pleading with Timothy to come and bring him 
the cloak and the parchments. Why did he need a cloak? He was cold in a Roman prison. What were the parchments? Scrolls and parchments. Scrolls may have been Old Testament scriptures. Parchments probably were New Testament scriptures. Maybe Paul uh, owned a copy of Matthew or Luke and wanted Timothy to bring it. The parchments. That's just a little bit speculative. But talking about Timothy, what do we know about Timothy besides he was Paul's loyal disciple? We have Paul's character reference for Timothy Again in Philippians, this is Philippians chapter 2. It's speaking about Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Verse 21, they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. By the way, you hear an echo of Demas there, verse 21. Verse 22 about Timothy. But you know of his proven, proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. That was Paul's attitude toward Timothy. Paul's warmth and closeness toward Timothy comes out in both of these epistles. Timothy was the person he relied on and he needed him there at the end of his life. Who else did he have? Back in 2 Timothy 4, verse 13, only Luke is with me. What do we know about Luke? In Colossians, Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician. Luke was Paul's personal doctor that traveled with him. Next time you read through Acts, Notice how part of the time in Paul's, the Paul portion of Acts, notice how part of the time Luke talks about them, and then all of a sudden it transitions to us and we. Luke joined with Paul and traveled with Paul in a significant portion of his missionary journeys recorded in Acts. He was Paul's traveling companion. He was a doctor. He was the beloved physician. He was a Gentile. And he wrote two books of our New Testament, Luke and Acts. Only Luke is with me. We've talked about Paul's future and his faith. Notice again, this is sort of his testimony at the very end of his life. Picking it up in verse 16, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord stood with me and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. When you are alone when there isn't another human being, when there isn't another caring person, when there isn't a brother or sister in Christ available to help you. And frankly, that's less common than it used to be because we all carry phones and people are available to us. Reach out to someone, ask them to pray for you. Do that. But when you are alone, can you Reach out to God. When you are alone, do you have the kind of relationship with God where he's there for you and you can be aware of his presence? If you are a child of God and he sees you becoming too dependent on other people, he will orchestrate situations where you depend on him and need him. Paul was alone, but God stood with him. An intriguing puzzle there at the end of the verse, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. What's he talking about? Paul was a Roman citizen. At least legally, he could not be thrown to the lions. He ended up being executed by the sword, a citizen's death. Maybe they were fudging the rules and throwing anybody to the lion who was a Christian. Maybe it's figurative. We don't know. God stood with him and rescued him. 
And notice verse 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Now, wait a minute. We began in verse 7 saying that, obviously, Paul expected to die. And he wasn't dying of old age or of natural disease. He died of execution. How then can he say, God's going to rescue me from every evil deed? He knew... He probably was aware, we talk about him having a a manuscript of Matthew. He probably was aware of Jesus teaching that we should not fear those that can kill the body, but fear him who is able to cast body and soul into hell. He knew that as soon as he was physically dead, he was going to be in the presence of the Lord. This is from his writing, 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. He also knew that physical death is not permanent. He gave us the great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. This is from Philippians. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Paul knew that being dead meant being with Jesus. Paul also knew that the resurrection was going to happen. Jesus was going to transform our bodies into glorious heavenly bodies. He expected to be rescued from every evil deed. How was he rescued from execution? He was rescued into heaven. Are we willing to trust God that much? Revelation 12, 11 is a fascinating verse. It talks about three things that defeat the devil. I'll let you look it up on your own. But the last one is not loving your life even to death. If there's nothing you want more than you want God, there's nothing the devil can yank you around with. This was Paul's end of life legacy. This was Paul's end of life testimony. This was Paul describing how he viewed his past and what he foresaw in his near future. How will it be for you and me? What will your legacy be? We don't know where the Apostle Paul is buried, although the Roman Catholics claim they do and they have a cathedral over it. But um, this is his, 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 his tombstone. That's exactly what it looks like. No, but it is his testimony. He said, I finished my course. Will this be your testimony? Will this be your tombstone? There is an alternative. What's the alternative? We saw the alternative in this passage. He deserted Christ having loved this present world. My friends, don't let that be your epitaph. Remember John Mark. He failed on his first go round and ended up being useful to God. If you happen to be at that point in your life and you're not walking with God victoriously right now, repent and get right with him and be useful to him for the future. What will your legacy be? Are you keeping the faith? Are you staying close to the Lord? Staying grounded in his word? Paul's legacy was reaching a huge portion of the then-known world, the center of the civilization of that day with the gospel. Are you proclaiming the gospel? And finally, Paul, at the end of his life, alone, 
with his loyal associates all gone away and other people having deserted him, still had Jesus. Do you know him? The gospel which Paul proclaimed is that salvation is a gift of God that we receive by grace because Jesus died to pay for our sins. Have you appropriated and received that gift? Do you know Jesus? Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the testimony. We thank you for the example of the great men of God, including the Apostle Paul. Last year, we studied the great men of God in the Old Testament in Hebrews 11. Lord, as we look at this legacy, may we strive to be faithful, to serve well for you, to remain true to the faith. Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts and transform us and conform our will to yours, as we sang earlier. Lord, I pray that if there are any who are away from you, backslidden, that they would return to you, knowing that you welcome prodigals, as you illustrated in your story. And Lord, I pray that if anybody does not know you, that they would give their lives to you and see their lives transformed as the Apostle Paul's life was transformed. Thank you, Lord, for your faithful servant. Help us to follow him as he followed Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's closing benediction is the benediction a few verses before the end of this book, 2 Timothy 4, 18. May the Lord rescue you from every evil deed and bring you safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go with God.